I'm Ken Furlick, and I thank the offer to be here. And I'm going to talk about creativity and transpersonal psychology. Not so much about transpersonal psychology as much as the creativity and how it relates to transpersonal psychology of something that you may find useful in your practice. So it's going to be more like building a bridge uh, between the two. And the reason for a bridge will become obvious, I think, in a little bit. Listening to me talk, I've been told is like trying to get a drink from a fire hydrant. So we may go quickly on some things, and I want to try and leave a lot of time for questions. So um, hopefully you'll get your thirst quenched, even though there's a lot happening. This understanding that I stumbled upon or accidentally stepped into was really like a Pandora's box for my life. And it may be a Pandora box for you if you really take a look at it. So I just want to let you know, you know, be truth and labeling that you could be opening Pandora's box and listening. So I'm going to set my timer for 45 minutes. So I, I leave enough time for questions. I'm going to give you all a test that you need to take at the end of this. And it's to answer a question. And what I suggest is what you're going to listen to, look at me as being referred to you as a patient or client, because some credentialed medical person said that there's something abnormal about this person, and um, they would like your diagnosis. So with that, I'm going to start. And for starting, I want to talk about some common ground. I operate from a creativity perspective. And what that is, is in anybody that I work with, I hold creativity and their creativity sacred. And the question is, where are they not allowed to fully step into their creativity because it's been controlled by some constraint, either an authority, some belief, or something? So the first thing I want to say, this is about creativity and our ability to create. <clears throat> On that note, um, to create is to bring into existence something that has not been previously seen or experienced. And this is important to realize because mind only knows the past. So if you're going to create something that's truly creative, you got to be out of mind to do it because otherwise you get pulled back into the past. So you need a different kind of ability. And this is where you have to feel. And this is about moving into what you feel and into your intuition. So it's moving from the mind into intuition, into feeling. Hence, you need a bridge. How do you bridge these two areas? Because your mind is constantly looking to try and understand. But how can it understand something it has not yet experienced? So this is where you are when you really step into creativity. Now, since it involves intuition and feeling, if you try and suppress pain, you're going to cut off your intuition and your ability to feel. So this is why pain is such an issue and why in many ways people aren't able to create what they want is because there's facets of pain they have to address to enter that area. So this moves us into transpersonal psychology, which I understand is centered on this spirituality or the spiritual aspects of uh, the human mind. So I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a transpersonal psychologist. So um, I may get it wrong. But psychology tends to focus on the mind and how the mind operates. Creativity is focused on feeling and outside of the mind and intuition. So there is this area hence the title, Creativity and Transpersonal Psychology, to bridge the gap. Now, I also like to bring in the Naropa tradition, because according to their website, it says, brilliant sanity is understood to be our very nature, and it's understood to be who we are. And as you will see, I think we're going to address exactly what our nature is and what we are. And you can decide for yourself if it's correct or not. Now, before I build this bridge, give you a little bit of background on myself. I was trained as an energy physicist. And as such, I never saw what I work with. I work with the unseen. And as long as all I needed was a good 
theory or paradigm to understand what I worked with and an instrument to detect it. And once I understood that, literally I could manipulate it and do things with that energy. So working in the unseen is not strange to me. It, it's, it's sort of the world I grew up in. Now, the world I grew up in, I was raised very conventionally. I was in a conventional religion with all its traditions, and I was raised very conventionally in society and all of its traditions. And the one thing in that society and the religious tradition was they always seemed separate. What the religion wanted, what the society wanted, they kind of went in different directions. And it never really bothered me. I was able to bridge that and walk through it and dance between the two. No big deal. But that was all going to eventually change. Now, I want to bring to your attention the power of intention, especially a clear, heartfelt intention. So if you ever set an intention, I recommend you pull the string as to why you have that intention. Why do I attend this? And you get an answer. And why do I attend that? You get an answer. Pull it like five times to really understand what's in your heart and in your passion. And the reason why I say that, there were two intentions I set very early in my life that had a big influence. One was, at 16, I felt what I was learning in school didn't really serve me. It was sort of a waste of my time. And I said, I only want to learn that which transcends time and place. I wanted to be able to go wherever I needed to go and have what I needed and not have to sit there and relearn all kind of little facts again. And the second was at age 19. There's an old proverb that says, a person learns from their mistakes. A wise man, a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. A fool never learns. And I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. And I said, you know what? I want to become wise. And I started to observe and watch. And both of those had a big bearing on what eventually happened. The second thing that sort of I want to bring to your attention is in 1973, I was being commissioned an ensign in the U.S. Navy. At the time, we were still in Vietnam, fighting the Russians and Chinese through a proxy war. The Israelis were fighting the Arabs. The Arabs were fighting the Israelis. The Israelis were praying to the God of Abraham to get rid of the Arabs. The Arabs were praying to the God of Abraham to get rid of the Jews. And the Christians were praying to the God of Abraham to throw the Jews and the Arabs out of Jerusalem so Christ could come back and take over. And I'm sitting here saying, you know, we're going to be in a shoot up war yet. And I thought, how does the God of Abraham bless any of these people? You know, was it on Monday I do the Israelis, on Tuesday I do the Arabs, on Wednesday I do the Christians and rotate it, and then come Saturday I rest, or Sunday rather, and we start again. So, you know, as a young man, I pondered these types of questions. And the question I asked was, is there one way to view creation such that no matter what a person believes, they will have an experience of that belief and then they point to it as the proof of what they believe was true. You know, and I kind of threw it out there. I never expected an answer. Eventually, I did find an answer. At this time, I was moving out of undergraduate school. And I was involved with a, a group of people, a small group of people that sort of prayed together. And I wondered why, why didn't they pray together like this, like they did in the early church? Why did they move to these re, these really big churches and everything? And then six months later, I was involved with something called a charismatic group, a Catholic charismatic group. And what it involved was you pray over people. And the intent was for the Holy Spirit to enter them. And lo and behold, when this occurred, the person changed. There was an energy. There was a passion. There was something that came forth. The context was, of course, it's this Holy Spirit that was catalyzing them. And I just took it at face value. But the problem was people started to come up to me and say, you healed me. And I said, yeah, right. Sure. Okay. Nice thought. I don't heal anybody. Well, I had to move. 120 miles away and got involved with another group, did the same thing. And they come up and said, you healed me. I said, I don't think so. But it continued. 
And I said, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm not getting involved with the church. I'm not getting involved with the medical people. I'm out of here. And I walked away from it. And I bring it up because certain things continue to recur in our life. And we'll talk more about our life and, and exactly why I say things continually reoccur. But the one thing I did notice was the person was changed. They had this energy, they had this passion, and even though it waned and kind of went by the wayside, they were different. They changed somehow. Something in them became different. And that was around 1975. Not much happened until 1985. And I have a note there as a correction, not 1887, 1987 for those who have the handout. But in 1985, I was asked to take a position um, because of my background. And the only problem was I'd have to work with a particular lady very closely. She was a nice lady, but she was tough. I mean, you didn't want to cross her. I mean, um, very intriguing lady. But they kept pressuring me to take this job because I was, they needed me. I was the perfect person. So I went and took it. And two days into the job in an office that we shared, which was about maybe nine by 12 feet, she came in crying. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I have breast cancer. And having been in the medical service corps, uh, I understood what that involved, the therapy. And over the next two years, we shared this very small office as she went through her treatment. And what happened was I saw one of the most beautiful flowerings of an individual I've ever seen. It was quite miraculous. And in many ways, because of that experience, I've come to understand that humans are like flowers, that we carry a seed, that if it's properly nurtured, it will germinate, it will grow, it will bud, it will flower, and the person's fragrance will go into the air. I mean, to me, it was so obvious, and I saw it. I saw it right before me. And then in 1987, I was asked to take a job with the Department of Energy, fixing a lot of health and safety issues that were carried over all the way back from the 1940s in the Manhattan Project. And in turning it down, I heard a voice. And the voice soulfully asked, who's going to protect my children? So I says, okay, I'll take the job. And immediately got on the phone and called up a psychologist I knew and said, uh, hey, I got to talk to you. I'm hearing voices. You know, what's going on here? So we sat down and talked. And she says, you have what's called a traditional calling. So I says, okay, fine. I'll go and protect people from nuclear radiation. I mean, that's what I thought it was all about. And um problem was, I ended up becoming a manager, and I was overseeing some of the most brilliant minds in the country. And they weren't giving me creative solutions. They were giving me solutions that worked elsewhere. You would hear them say, well, it worked over there. And it's like, but that's not our problem. Give me something truly creative. Give me something original. And I couldn't see them getting out of the box. And I'm saying, why? Why aren't these people able to play with creative ideas like they did like little children? Why were they so limited in, in, in what they were trying to do? Couldn't they get out of the box? So I started to study creativity. Again, I started to study it very conventionally. And I say conventionally because I went to the literature. I went to the books. I read what was written on it. All the traditional ways that we study something. Well, what did the people before us write up and report? And then in 1995, oh, I guess I should say in 1992 as a manager, as soon as I took over managing, um, and this has a bearing, I think, because sometimes we set intentions and don't pay attention to them. As a manager, I had to put up with some people that I really didn't like. I mean, I, it's like, um, they weren't necessarily pleasant to work with. They were annoying. They were pain in the, the posterior. And um, 
That's a polite word, but you all know what I mean. So I said, you know what? I'll set the intention to be unconditional love. And then I can accept these people and work with them and kind of be gracious to them. So I did. I made a transcript. I recorded it and put it on the headphones and played it every night when I went to bed, that transitional state between wakeness and sleep. And very quickly, I had a very interesting insight. And it was about Christ and Judas. It was reported that Christ, Judas was the apostle that Christ loved. So you ask, why would you do such a thing that Judas was reported to have betrayed Christ? And the insight was a little conversation that Christ went up to Judas and said, hey, Judas, I need you to do a favor for me. No problem, JC. I'll do whatever you want. What's up? Um, I'd like you to betray me. What are you talking about? Me betray you? Come on now. What gives? Judas, I need somebody to betray me so I can do my work. Will you betray me? But why would I betray you? I love you. That's why I'm asking you. Are you willing to do this for me? Because I don't know what the repercussions will be in your life, but it has to happen. So, obviously, Judas said, okay, I love you. I'll do it for you. And he betrayed him. That insight became very powerful because I found out relative to oneness and living in oneness, it's an extremely important insight to know. And then shortly after that, actually a couple of years, three years later, there was an individual which there was a profound compassion in my heart. And I mean profound compassion to take the creativity I learned to try and free the person's heart. You say, why would you do that? Well, if you remember, I said in 1985, I spent two years with a flower blossoming. I know what a fulfilled individual looks like. I've seen it. I looked at this individual, given everything they were facing in their life, I said, ah, they need to be released from things that were preventing their creativity to come out, their passion to come out. So in this compassion and what I was feeling in this heart, I created a series of rituals, ceremonies, meta theaters, somewhat shamanic in hindsight. And that went on for a short period of time. But parallel to this, almost at the exact same time, I was getting bored in my job. I mean, it was being, getting to be the same routine thing again and again. I thought, well, you know, what else can I do? I'm not going to spend the next 25 years doing this. So as a young physicist, knowing that I never saw what I worked with and the human body is made of molecules, I wonder if the human body detects energy and could we figure out how to detect it? So I said, where would I start to even consider that idea? So I started to visit a bunch of different psychics and say, okay, they're sensing something. Can I figure out what they sense? And I did. And, but what I found from the psychics was that we each have a very unique path that is almost not predestined. I wouldn't say predetermined. What I would say, it's like a raindrop falling on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. It will fall, run down the mountain run through the Great Plains, into the Mississippi River, into the Gulf of Mexico, and into the Atlantic Ocean. Somewhere on that path, it will go through each of those predetermined, predetested, predestined experiences. Now, what actually occurs in those experiences and how one would respond to them, that's completely open. But we have these life paths. These life paths, to me, are so profound that 
if I left you with one message, it would be the following. Inspire the person to get in touch with their life path. Empower them to step into it. And do what you can to create the safe space for them to do their experiments to fully understand what it is. I know of no greater gift you can give somebody. Because the universe itself has things it would like us to accomplish. Now, I can't prove that, except that when I use it with people who involve get involved with me from their creativity perspective, it can transform them. So, where did this lead? Well, I applied it to this person. And roughly over a period of three months, I saw one of the most profound, beautiful people unfold. And it was extremely profound. But I saw something else happen. The 28-year-old lady took roughly two years of battling cancer and feedback to find this beautiful blossoming. I achieved that in three months with this person. But something else happened. I saw the Greek myth of Persephone being played out before my eyes. I literally saw this beautiful flower being crushed. And it was being crushed by the mind. And that caused me to wonder, why? Why was this creative spirit being put in the cage of the mind's own making? What is this all about? The question was, how did the mind capture the spirit and why? Now, almost simultaneously with me observing this, I was giving a reward or maybe a curse. I still haven't decided which it is, but there was a profound insight about the nature of creation how creation works, and many aspects of creation. One of the things was that I come to understand about the love and the compassion that lies behind creation. Now, this I find very intriguing. I wasn't looking for wisdom or knowledge. I wasn't looking for achieving any kind of notoriety or advancing in a tradition. I wasn't in any spiritual practice. This creative spirit was the same thing I saw 20 years earlier in a religious context. In an instant, I knew the universe didn't work the way we're taught it was. In a religious context, there was a spirit. In a completely secular, there was this exact same spirit. Question is, what was going on here? Now, There were several other things that caused me to re-examine things. I came to understand a different definition of love. For me today, love means to nourish the true needs of a creation. It's not to give what you want to give it. You give it what causes it to grow and flower and blossom. What does that look like in a human being? There's an expansion within their being. There's a contentment within their being. There's an inner satisfaction that doesn't run dry no matter what's happening in the world. When people find this, they have found the essence of their being, and it's creative. So what I learned was there's this creative spirit within each individual that if an individual doesn't live it in some way to some extent, they'll never find happiness in life. They'll always be feeling as though something is missing. Why isn't life working out well what is this thing about when somebody finds it there's a contentment there's a satisfaction there's almost a moment of ah i get it so that caused me to completely change my life and what i found was the understanding was that creation didn't work the way any of the religious traditions said Creation didn't work the way 
a lot of the sciences said. It did work a lot related to energy and quantum mechanics has been a godsend of the power of the observer to change what's observed. Because the one thing I did come to understand is how we observe becomes very, very important, whether it be our lives or any other person. So the download of information is what a lot of people would say you got to download. It wasn't a download. Downloads are linear. Basically, it's like standing on the top of a high mountain, almost like the picture behind me, where I could see the expanses of the valley in one setting. Or it's a bird's eye view of looking down onto creation and seeing. And when I come to understand, this is available to all of us. The question is, what keeps us from it? And as I said, I was not looking for it. I wasn't looking for anything other than to free a person's heart and get them back into their passion and their creativity out of compassion. And I have no doubt that there's a compassion behind all of us. We may not understand our lives or why or where we're going, but there's a life path that we're following. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, they want to work with me, that's what I get them in touch with. Now, why is this important? Well, in starting to work with people, I found it was very important that people speak their truth. So I got a hold of a truth stick. And when I got it into my possession, the question that was offered me was, Will I, am I willing to hold truth? And I said, yes. And what is a truth stick? A truth stick, people talk about talking sticks and they pass it around and everybody says, hey, that's kind of a neat idea. You don't get interrupted when you have the truth stick or the talking stick. But the truth stick comes from a different paradigm. The truth stick used to be something that was held by the shaman of the tribe. And they would go into council when important tribal decisions had to be made. And it was passed around. And if the person didn't speak the truth, when they had the truth stick, the shaman's magic would go after them. And if anybody tried to take retribution against anybody who spoke the truth under the truth stick, the shaman's magic would go after them. Because the value of truth and speaking your truth was so important. And I come to understand there's two truths. One is the truth with a big T. Very few, and I don't think any human will ever know it, because the human mind is limited. The truth is well beyond the human mind. But there's a personal truth. And we have a life path. And there are things that are true for me that are not true for you. It's like the truth of a fish is not the same as the truth for a tree. And yet humans go around thinking that we all live the same truth. And the answer is that's not true. And if we try and live outside our truth, we will feel pain. And then we try and numb the pain. And why would we want to numb that pain? Because we hadn't figured out where it's come from. We have to live our truth to live our authentic self. If you've listened to Gabor Mate, which I believe a lot of you have, he will talk about the authentic self being compromised before we have retrievable memories. So the challenge is, how do we find that authentic self? How do we find that authentic self that the Naropa tradition talks about? And it's a creative truth. That if we don't create what we came here to do, we won't be happy. We won't find the contentment of life. To me, it's a very powerful understanding. And I'm at a loss to how to convince people how to find it because it's a feeling. You got to feel it. You have to feel your personal truth. That's why I try to create the discerning truth exercise and the calibrating internal compass exercise. With both are available. You can do them in your own time because it's a feeling. Because don't forget, you incarnated before your current mind existed. So your current mind don't know, can't know what it is. You got to feel it. Now, when you get the minimum set of experiences, then you can understand and say, oh, this is what I'm here to do. 
I feel it. I feel the passion. I feel the fullness in my being. But most people are living their programming. So the question is how to get out of the programming. A lot of the stuff that's out there is a red herring that people are running after. and They don't pay attention to their own truth that comes from their own being. You all know what truth looks like. You all know what makes you internally happy if you pay attention to it. So that was Pandora's box for me. Completely destroyed my life. And what I found was most intriguing that surprised me was ever since I got the understanding, I kept looking, is it true? Where am I wrong? Where is it wrong? I don't want to give people false information. Is it correct? And I was listening to a talk by Stefan Groff, who did the early experiments with LSD. And he talked about all the things that they learned from it. And I was surprised. I said, everything he's talking about is in my writing. Everything was available in that knowing. So how do we access it? Because he was talking about developing holotropic breathing, saying, hey, you don't need the LSD. Do the holotropic breathing and get the same information. So why do we think one way is better than another? Well, part of what came with the understanding is we're here to have experiences based on our life path. Some people are almost destined to have certain types of experiences. Other people try and copy those experiences because they say, well, this person found great awareness in this experience, so I got to do it their way. And the answer is they've compromised their own truth. The challenge is to live your own truth because you're a unique creation and nobody can do what you're capable of doing. It's available to each of us and it's unique. And that's the beauty of creation. And the question is how to get people into that because it's outside of our mind. That's basically the story of how I got the understanding that I did. And most of my life is trying to figure out the depth and breadth of it. I spent about five years creating a bunch of websites. They're on the list. They're being revised because I'm cutting back on the number of domain names because it's getting expensive. So you can go there and read some of it. And hopefully it'll be there because I'm trying to shift the hyperlinks again to cut back. But the thoughts. One is you have a creative sphere within each of us. But yet we put our creativity in a box. And people say, I want to break out of the box. I want to transform my life. They do a good job breaking out the sides. They change jobs. They change their advisors. They move somewhere else. They create a different lifestyle. But they never address the top of the box or the bottom of the box. The top of the box is their relationship with the unseen. Usually most people have some concept of a creator or God, or they completely deny existence of a creator of a God, and they never explore the unseen to say, what is it really? How does it work? And then there's the bottom of the box. It's how do you plug yourself into the physicalness of your being, which unfortunately includes sex or sexuality, because then all of a sudden you're faced with trying to understand your own sexuality and what it's asking you to do. Very powerful. When you're in the creative inspiration of the universe, your body will be infused with an energy that infuses and excites your whole body. And the sexual organs happen to be part of your body, so they get excited. So people then run after the sex and lose the creative energy. Whereas they got to stay focused on the energy. This brings up the concept of the muse. The muse is real. But most people don't understand what the muse really does for the person and how it excites them. And too many people just get involved in the sex, then they forget it. So there is this creative spirit, and it creates, and it needs to create what it incarnated to do. On this point, there's two views of creation. There's the view of the mind and the view of the heart. The view of the heart is about feeling. The view of the mind is about thinking. Most people only see one view of creation. If I hold up two fingers, there, 
two fingers, and I say, put your hand over one eye, you'll see two fingers. If I say, put your hand over the other eye, you'll see two fingers. In reality, you're seeing four fingers. It's just that the two views are brought together. And we're taught to take the view of the heart and suppress it to the view of the mind. In reality, there's two views. It's like your eyes. You use glasses. Some people have eyes that are not really equal. So they have different lens in each eye. And what do they do? They force the two eyes into one view. That's what humanity's done. They took the view of the mind, the view of the heart, shoved them together. And when it comes to feeling, people don't pay attention to feeling. They don't pay attention to how intuitive they are and what information is available. Because your body's a sensor. It's an energy sensor. It's picking up the energy of creation, and it's focusing, focusing it into a human experience. But in addition to that, it's sensing the environment. You can know things through feeling. Energy has information. All communication is energy, and yet we get it. We get all these devices like an iPhone, an iPad, a radar, a radio. And all we are is taking the energy and extracting the information out of it. So every feeling has information if we pay attention to it. The life path. We're groomed for the life path that we're on. I said, I set an intention at age 16, at 19. I brought up questions when I was being commissioned in 1973. I was being groomed for an understanding. I spent two years with a lady with breast cancer, watching her blossom into a beautiful flower. I was groomed to apply what I knew about creativity because the universe put me in a situation where I was drawn to study creativity. All of these things were grooming me for an understanding. And what I'm trying to communicate to you, you are being groomed. A lot of you want to go into some kind of mental health counseling or therapy or something like that if it's true that everybody has a unique life path and a person steps into your office with certain experiences do you consider them textbook says this is what's wrong with them or you sit back and say hey what's their life communicating to them you know one of the big things that impacted me was addictions because i came from a family that had addictions and when somebody close to me and I asked them, when are you done with the 12-step program? He says, well, I was an addict. We're always recovering. Hey, wait a minute. I'm working with physicians that create mind-body foundations that heal people. And you're telling me you don't heal? Why? So I went and looked at the 12-step program. And I critiqued it from a creativity perspective. And I wrote up the 15 creative step guidelines. Didn't do anything with it until I read about the life of the founder of the 12-step program. And the article was a little critical because he did certain things early in life. I thought there, I said, I did that. I did that. I did that. I know what he was looking for. I know why he was frustrated. I know why he got his addiction. He wasn't able to develop that relationship with the unseen that he was looking for because society wouldn't allow him. So he created the 12 step program. The problem with a lot of addictive programs is the person's in a culture that forces them in pain. They go to somewhere to get healed and then they go back into that world where they're in pain. So they're constantly never breaking out of the cycle. So I want to talk about oneness for a minute. One of the biggest impacts is what does it mean that everything comes out of a oneness? I keep hearing people say, well, someday we'll all live in peace. Someday we'll all interact and be in this oneness. We already are in oneness. I like to relate it to Radio stations. All the radio stations are there. But when you tune yourself on the dial to a different station, you pick up another station. 
Everything is always interactive in oneness. And I will take you back to the Judas Christ story. Everything we do needs that other person to give us the experience. In the oneness of creation, there's an interconnectedness. And we call into our life the events, the people, to give us the experience that we incarnated to have that's a result of our life path. So when somebody's in front of you and they cause you to be annoyed for whatever reason, like the driver who just cut you off, you get angry or do you sit back and maybe do what's called honopono, beautiful Hawaiian tradition. It's a realization that somehow, in some way, I created this experience. So I'm sorry, forgive me. Thank you for the experience. I love you. I love myself. I don't know how I created it, but I take responsibility for it and I let it go. When you start doing that routinely, you start be saying, well, how much of this experience is mine that I've caused or I agreed to participate in? I know you like stories. There's a gentleman that came into my store. I bought a train shop, by the way, because the most powerful thing you can do is play. I used to give workshops, and all my attendees were female. I'm saying, where's the men? How come the men don't come to these workshops? And the answer was, they like to play with toys. And trains were one of the most areas where I saw grown men become like little kids again. So I bought a train store, get them to play. And they do play, and they come back, and they recapture their childhood that they forgot a long time ago because the world made them become something different. And I had one man who happened to be in the first Iraq war who was discharged because of shrapnel in his leg. He sat in my store. And he said, you know, Ken, I'm really sad. I, I blew this kid away, maybe 20 feet from me. And I said, what's the issue? You wanted to be a soldier. He wanted to die a martyr. You gave him what he wanted. And you got what you wanted. And he looked at me and got up and walked out. He had a towing company. And he had something on layaway. Couldn't get in touch with him. And finally he calls me and says, hey, Ken, I've been meaning to get back in touch with you. I sold my towing company. I moved to Florida. I got my pilot's license. And now I'm the manager of a small airport. And I know, without a doubt, that he was able to release the burden he carried. Because he realized, yes, I wanted to be a soldier. What does a soldier do? I said that in 1974 and 5, I prayed over people, and they said I healed them. I knew something was wrong with that picture. And when I understood about our creative power in oneness, if I want to be a healer, guess what I need to have the identity of a healer? I need sick people. So if I want to be a healer, I have to create sick people to have my identity. I have no desire to make people sick. I'm happy to create a new life with them where they don't have to be sick because they're a creator and they can create something that better serves them. I'm happy to do that. But I never want to be called a healer. I don't want to create sick people. So I'm very aware of my thoughts and how I observe people make a difference. I spent many years teaching people. If I assume somebody, well, they're dumb, that's what I'm going to see as a dumb person. If I say, no, they're not dumb, they just need a little attention. And with the proper guidance, they can perform well. And that's what I see. I can attest to my own son in that regard. He's accomplished things I never thought he would do when I was tutoring him. I thought, this kid ain't going to make it. But I trust a whole the space open for him to grow and unfold true to himself. The creative spirit, creation is part of every aspect of our life. People talk about creativity and they talk about artists and painters. They never talk about financiers. They never talk about the carpenter. 
They never talk about the mechanic. They never talk about all the other facets of creating that haven't been done before because they see creation and creativity so narrowly. So what I'm trying to get you to understand, if you want to look into the realm of the spiritual, understand to think there's a spiritual path is to live in separation because everything's in oneness. Nothing is more spiritual than anything. Nothing's more sacred than anything. You know, people talk about sacred sex and I have to chuckle. What isn't sacred? What's important is what's your intention with the person that's in front of you? I don't care who it is and what you're going to do. Are you more interested in their fulfillment and unfoldment as a beautiful human being? Or are you in there to get something from them? We live in a predatory world. We all eat something, we'll all be eaten. If we give ourselves over to eat in communion, it's a wonderful experience. I want to give you the opportunity to ask any question you want. And if there's things that you want to ask and we don't have time for, you can always send me an email. You can contact me through my websites, and I'm happy to explain any of it. But I want you to understand this creative spirit, the only medical person in my writing, I say, we put our creativity in a cage of our own making. We suffer pain, so we put a bar up and say, I'm going to keep them out. I'm going to keep them out over here. And we build this cage trying to protect ourselves. And what we do is compromise our own creativity. Gabor Mate is the only medical person that I have seen say, we deny our authentic self. And the brilliance of what he said was, we do it before we become aware with conscious memories. Because we want that love. We want that infection. We want that caregiver to accept us and love us. So we do anything to get that attention. And then we compromise ourselves. So how do we regain that? So with that, I'm open to questions. I I can't believe there aren't some questions. There are. Uh, okay. Um, I have a question, Ken, about the word the term life path. Yes. Um. So some of us are uh, a little connected into astrology, and some of these terms that are being used, we have our worldview, and we kind of try to maybe assimilate to what you're saying. Can you speak a little bit to what your definition of life path is? Because mine's a three. Um, see, now I'm being pushed into the realm of the creator. Um, <laughs> people have talked about a higher self. The Hawaiian tradition talks about a higher self, a middle self, a lower self. The lower self tends to be the body, the middle self, more the consciousness, and then there's this higher self. A lot of people talk about a higher self. Um, I mentioned the Hawaiian tradition is because that's where I had one of my major breakthroughs. In fact, I'll tell you where I had the major breakthrough and when it happened and what happened when it happened was I was driving to Virginia for a meeting. And I made the realization that in Sanskrit, they said the word represents the sound of the essence. And a tree was given this name. And the Hawaiian tradition said the exact same thing, but a tree wasn't called the same sound, the same word. I said, what's wrong with this? And then a stone hit my windshield and it cracked. The human mind filters. The life path to me is our higher self has chosen to come down and have certain experience. A part of it has chosen to be here to have certain experiences. If you think about or listen to any of the stuff about pre-life planning, it's about, well, there's decisions made to come down. Well, what no one really talks about is there's a part of a self that's connected to the entire universe. You know, you've probably heard about uh, Guru saying we're like a wave, we're troughs, 
and we're the peak of the wave and then the trough. Well, our uniqueness goes into the unseen and it's interconnected with everything else. So the life path is the awareness of what we are says, I'm going to incarnate into physical creation. And physical creation, the way I like to explain it is like the geography of the earth. There's mountain ranges, there's plains. And when the water hits one continental divide, it flows in a certain path and there are certain predetermined events that it will experience. We do the same thing energetically. Astrology tries to capture the energy, the terrain, so to speak. Pluto might be seen, uh, not Pluto, Saturn may be seen as a great big mountain chain. Jupiter is a great big mountain chain. Venus may be a beautiful, lush plain. So when Venus comes into the chart, it's like saying, well, you're now going to travel through a nice plain rather than climbing a mountain. Okay. It's analogously the exact same thing. People have intuited this for centuries and are looking to explain it. So they look whatever way they can. So they look to the astrology. They look to oracles. They look for divination tools because the energy terrain is set for physical creation. So the life path is the path that we, our unique path that our higher self has chosen for us to weave through physical creation. I don't know if does that answer the question? Okay, I guess that's a thumbs up or, by the way, I understand the thumbs up doesn't mean um, let the guy live. From my understanding, the Romans went this way to say, take that sword and shove it up, as opposed to this way, which represented let him live. So I thought that was a, that was a very quirky thing that, I don't know if it's true, but it seems to make sense. You know, so when you go like that, it's like, Okay, stick them with the show. But anyway. Oh, that's funny. What else? What else? Thumbs up. Okay, yeah. No, well, yeah. Um, so for co-creating, for the way I see creation, for humans, so far we've used art, storytelling, um, music, you know, different technologies to express what's going on and so coming from your background your educational background I believe you said physics was your yes okay what do you see what do you perceive possibly okay here you are you're going to co-create now what do you perceive as the next tool of expression for human beings do you think we have another way of expressing yeah this here uh, I this I it's what I hate about it this is a piece of paper okay uh, it's completely... <laughs> we see it. You see it. Okay. Sometimes. That's called the nothingness. There is no form to this. Okay. <laughs> it's just flat, not no form, right? But if I were to take a pair of scissors and cut out a heart, there's now a heart in the center of the paper, and there's the heart that came out. Okay. This is you, this heart. This is the world you experience. When you decide to change and you take this piece and then put it back into the oneness, wherever it fits, okay? All of a sudden, your creation's different. You're different. So I'm sitting here. I don't know how many people are out there and it is a lady that has helped me do some recordings because her voice is much more pleasant to listen to than mine. I said, there's a synchronicity occurring that we're together because our higher selves orchestrated this. And there's something you will give me and I will give you. And I don't necessarily know what it is. But I've come to understand that what comes into my life is not by chance. And I have to ask, why is this here? Why is this, you know, I, I don't mean to 
call people out, but whenever I, I give a workshop, I love to talk to people and say, so there's a, that he's sitting here very intently. And I know that he is here for something. And he's there because out of all the people here, I can focus on him as an individual that I'm talking to, to help keep my eyes focused in the direction. Because if I put him down, you'll get a glare from my glasses. As a minimum, he's there to help me give this lecture because it's hard to focus on an audience in Zoom. So the next move for creation is where we begin to understand that I am a creator and I'm calling these things into my life but the person who's really calling him in is my higher self. So I got to talk to it. You know, I don't know if you know of Carolyn Mace. She talks about God is law. And she talks somewhat impersonal about the universe. And that's true. But also, we have a very intimate relationship with our creator, who's our higher self. When Christ said, I and the Father are one. People say, well, he's talking about this big creator of the entire universe. On one hand, that's sort of true, but he's really talking about this part of himself that created this life path for whatever reason. And my comment is, have a relationship with it. Know that it's personal. When I started my journey and I had this compassion to free this person's heart, I vividly remember telling God as I knew God, either help me or get the hell out of the way. Because I'm going to do what I can to allow this person to see the beauty of their own being and their own passion, because I know what it looks like. And I was saying, you know, if I'm going to go to hell for it, so be it. I'll go to hell if that's what it takes. And I have to chuckle because the God of the underworld, the underworld is considered that hell. What is the God of the underworld? It's that mind that captures this creative spirit and doesn't allow it to feel the beauty of creation. I mean, when you're crea- creating in your creative passion and you're doing what you love, you know, what more can you ask for? And what keeps you from it is this thing called mind. Mommy said, daddy said, the church said, my teacher said, I got to do this for my professor. My son, I taught him clarinet. I said, when you practice, you practice three ways. You practice for the director. Give him what he wants or her. Two, you practice for technique. And three, you practice what you love that gives you passion. Because that's that passion and the love of the playing is what will allow you to deal with the other two. So if you want to face life, understand your passion and live it in some way. And you will have a fulfilling life. And you'll be able to tolerate the mundane job. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate it. I have a question. And, um, yeah, um, I was just making fun of myself that I'm, I'm so turned on by all of this. I can hardly collect myself right now. Um, one of the things that I don't know how to ask this question, but it, that I'm really intrigued by is this idea of the two needs of authenticity, authentic self-expression and love and connection and how we will sacrifice from birth authenticity for love and connection, to to get love and connection. And and yet it seems like the experience of, of being human or the experience of this life is relational and we need other it's almost like we need that trauma of of losing self in order to have the experiences that we need in this human life but then we come full circle almost like we come in alone we go out alone i don't know can you say more about those needs of of Okay, I, I, it's 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 a fantastic question, and um, what goes through my mind are several things. Humans have a very narrow perspective. 
one of the things that intrigued me for the longest time was all these different spiritual teachers would have experiences. And I remember one who referred to the bright. I forget who his name was. And he talked about being in the bright and it's like, but he didn't realize that we're all unique. And he came back with his understanding. And I started to understand. I thought, well, you know, everybody has their own understanding. What does it mean to be in your passion? Now, I don't know you, so I don't know anything about your life. But if I sat with you and had you go back in memories and say, what has really made you feel life's worth living? That this is good. Or this person really causes me to somehow be excited in doing whatever it is I was doing or wanted to do. That passion, that excitement is the thing that guides your life. Now, it may change with your age. I mean, when you're six years old, what you feel passionate about isn't going to be what you're at at 16 or at 25. But this passion is still there. And that's related to the life path. Because as you grow, this 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 passion that this this heartfelt passion guides you to where you need to be so unfortunately in relationships sometimes you find this person that has really excited you and after a period of time you find the passion isn't there anymore and the answer is why and the answer is it doesn't mean they don't love you it may be that your life path is saying hey there's other things we need you to do or you came down here to incarnate. And if you stay with them because you 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 made a commitment under the, the, the rules of your society, you start living in hell because you're not able to be in your passion. But then again, you might say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't mean I got to separate from this person. I just got to not look for them to fulfill me. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, each of us have a different passion. And one of the things I try and do is, can I get the person in front of me to step into their passion? Can I get them to, to fully appreciate what is it that makes them feel alive? And then not judge them for it. You know, somebody likes rock music. I'm not really into rock music. Do I judge them for it and say, you should be listening to symphonic music? Personally, I get bored with some symphonies after a while. That's why I didn't go into music, because I didn't want to become a, a a musical. See, when I grew up, there were three things a musician could do. One was nightclubs and bars. One was classical music in orchestras. And the third one was to teach. I really didn't want to teach music. I used to get bored playing the same stuff all the time. And bars and clubs weren't really acceptable to my family and my religion. So it's like, well, I guess I can't go into music. And yet music has still been a part of my life. In fact, music was one of the biggest things that taught me how to manage people. That's another story. But I don't know. I'm, I'm going off in Never Never Land. Did, did any of your question get answered? That was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Okay. You know, I, I'm sitting here. And I don't know how to explain this. My heart feels, I wish I could give you all that I've come to understand about the beauty of creation and what's possible. And I don't know how to do it other than what I've tried to do. And, and I gave you my story and I said in the beginning, if I was sitting in your office and you were to diagnose me because I'm abnormal in some way, how would you diagnose me? Would I be considered crazy? Or would I be considered, well, this guy's just having experiences we don't have, or he's having the delusions of grandeur? Hey, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up something personal. I'm going to put him on the spot. He's a wonderful editor. He's very insightful. I am, no, in, insightful. I'm, I'm insightful. He's insightful, but I incite in a different way. I'm I N S I G H T. I think he's, no, I'm I N I N C I T E. He is insightful in ideas. In reading one of my writings, when I said I got a calling 
And he said, no, no, it's not calling. It's called something clinically. And I looked at the clinical word. Is he saying that I imagined this or was it real for me? And I don't fault because I think one of the problems we do is we start to clinicize things and we don't see what's really unfolding. I mean, even as a, a physicist, they do it. They, they accept the theory and say, this is the way it is. And I say, look, the data doesn't fit. And the answer is, I don't care. This is the way we do it. This is exactly where physics was at the turn of the uh, 20th century in 1900. People did not want to hear the fact that data wasn't fitting anymore. Where we are with humans is there is this intuitive side, this feeling side, this ability to know things. You know, I spent my life looking at creativity, thinking that, well, if I focus myself and I put enough passion in there, I can manifest this. And then when I understood the life path, I realized some of these thoughts I have may be my intuition reading my future having a thought and saying, I want to create this. So I hold it to create it when it's already in my path. And my ego says, look what I created. Now my ego says, you know what? I don't think I created it. I think I saw what was destined for me. And when I look at some of the astrology and the way it's interpreted, I begin to say, you know what? I'm beginning to think there are things destined for me that are more magnificent than I could imagine. It's just that my mind keeps getting in the way and I don't follow my own path. So then I sit there and bitch about why things aren't giving me what I want. Um, but I, I wish, God, I wish it was an easy way for me to kind of open up your mind and dump it all in. You're doing it. <laughs> You're doing it. What can I say? Um, I, I know everybody... My comment is do your own experiments and use what works for you. Eat and digest everything you're given. That which is useful, take it and be part of yourself. That which is not useful, discard it the same way you discard the food you don't use. You have to make it yourself. Don't just accept something because um, I'm going to get into trouble now. Said this. So as our teacher, so she is correct. And we have to follow what she taught us. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> huh? Where's the mic? <laughs> I woke somebody up at least. But seriously, that's one of the faults about a teacher. And I try and tell a close friend of mine, I'm not trying to teach anybody. I just want to bring their own awareness to the beauty within their own heart. But sometimes you have to teach them only because they don't have the paradigm. They don't have the the understanding to say, how is it possible I can be responsible for this. Well, our paradigms are antiquated, you know, um, and, and I have to cringe. To create is to bring that which has not been previously experienced. So let us go back to what the elders said. Let us go back what the ancients said. Let us go back to what our history said. And the answer is we're repeating the past. How can you walk into the unknown without the past? That's the challenge. I was just listening to um, a revisit of Alan Watt. I, I ran across something. And he said, I'm going to use somebody else's analogy of trying to drive forward in a car, continually looking out your rear view mirror. In some ways, that's what we do in life. We look at the future and then look at that past and say, well, I'm going to make the future like my past so it's safe. But. When we don't know, then fear steps in. And you say, last time I was afraid, all of this, this, and this happened. So how do we step past our fears? So, I mean, they're, they're real challenges. And everybody's fears are different. You know, um, what can I say? I don't mean to ramble. I, I, I get carried away. Well, how can we step past fears? Depends on what your fears are. Some people say, well, if you don't like snakes, go play with snakes. Yeah. Or some people say, some people say, well, you have a fear of snakes because in your past life, you got bit by one and died. You know, 
I, I, I had a fear of snakes and I sort of still do, depends on which ones they are. I kind of look at their color. But I remember walking around the corner of the house and on the concrete was this beautiful copper snake. And the first thing I did was run and get my uncle because he was an outdoorsman. Unfortunately, by the time he came back, it was gone. But then I was driving with a friend and we were going over the Western Continental Divide in Arizona. He invited me on a trip to the Southwest. And going over there, I remember being a Native American Indian boy getting bit by a snake and dying. I don't know if it's true, but that's what I felt. That's what I saw. So my comment is, is my fear of snakes due to the fact as a little kid, I got frightened by the snake on the concrete, or it's because in a previous life, I experienced an energy that caused me to die or to suffer. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. So the question is, should you do a past life regression to understand your fear? Or do you just come up with some night trick to step past your fear? And the answer is, what is the experience your life path calls you to do? If, you're, if you feel in your heart, I should do a past life regression, or maybe I should go take an ayahuasca trip, or maybe I should go and, and meditate. I mean, each person's heart is different. And not one side doesn't fit all. This is what, what is challenging. If somebody comes in and says, hey, Ken, I'd really like you to help me on a problem. I said, sure, what is it? I kind of have to throw out a lot of my knowing. Oh, the other thing I'll ask. The mind that created the person in front of me is not going to be the mind that sees that person different. Okay? So one thing I do if I'm going to work with somebody is say, how do I need to, what do I need to do? What do I need to become? How do I need to think to create that space for this person to become or get what they desire? Because the mind that brought that person into my life is not the mind that's going to see that person different in the way they want to be different. So how do I have to change for that other person? And that's challenging because it says, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge. Well, maybe I need to kind of step off the pedestal and say, well, maybe I need to be a little humble here and see what this person's really asking of me. Um, it's a challenging way to live. Um, I'm talking again. Did your, um, the understanding of the snake, did it resolve the fear or does it still, did it have as much intensity after learning about it? In becoming a little bit more aware of where snakes live and education, I, like I went to Boulder and we're walking on the Creek in Boulder, kind of walking through the, the little, I assume you all went down to the Creek in Boulder, right? You haven't done that yet. You should do that. It's a nice creek. Um, and then walking along the grass, I thought, hmm, I wonder what kind of snakes they got in the grass. So I asked one of the policemen, you guys got any problems with snakes around here? He said, no, because I know at certain elevations, the snake problem goes the way or certain types of snakes. If I'm down in the Florida swamps, I'm going to look for those snakes. Believe it. Um you're or I'm going to wear boots that are nice and high that if I do get step into something. So to me, I think dealing with any fear, and maybe that's why I spent most of my career in safety, what's the hazard? And can I address the hazard and mitigate the consequences of anything going wrong? And then step out and face what you need to face. And usually the fears are, are sort of irrational and we can get past them if we apply ourselves. But don't let the fear immobilize you. I think that's the one piece of advice I would offer. Try and figure out some way to get around it. Ken. Yes. I also want to ask you to speak a little more. You know, you use the word grooming. Yes. I disagree about the context of that word. But can you use another word? Or can you tell a little more context for how the universe grooms you or how we're groomed by the universe without using that word? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think this is where humanity has believed we're here to learn and we're here to have experiences to learn. 
I don't necessarily believe that. I think some people are here because this is the greatest amusement park in the universe, and they're down here to just enjoy themselves. Some people are here to learn. Some people are here to help. Some people are here to grow. I think a replacement for grooming is we will have experiences that prepare us into the future. Let me tell you a story. This is this this to me is one of the most profound examples I can think of. When I was in ninth grade, my music teacher had a high a grade school band and he needed some clarinet players. So he took me and another gentleman and he had us play in his grade school band so they could play a little better than grade school kids. And he gave me a handwritten piece of music. And I was in high school. And every piece of music I saw was printed, you know, for like 80, 90 pieces. So I always gave him a printed sheet of music as opposed to a handwritten sheet. This guy used to have a big um, dance band back in the 40s when, you know, but dance bands were big. So he used to handwrite a lot of music. And I looked at it and it didn't pay attention to really why I was giving me a handwritten piece of music. When I was in college, I became the company commander for an NROTC band that sounded really bad. I, I couldn't believe they allowed them to perform in public. And I looked at it and I knew the musicians because most of them were in the college band with me. And I said, these are good musicians. How come they sound so horrible? And then I looked at their music. I said, oh, look at that. This music is orchestrated for a hundred piece band. I got 16 people. I don't have three sections of trumpets and clarinets. I got two trumpet players and maybe a clarinet player. So I sat there and I said, oh, I'll do what my music teacher did. Let me orchestrate it for the people that's in that band. And I sat down that summer and wrote all the music out that we needed to play for those 16 people. And we performed it. And lo and behold, kids going to and from class stopped to listen to the music because it sounded good. And then I realized when I was a manager, orchestrate the work for what you have. Look at the people. What are their talents? What are their weaknesses? Where are their strengths? And give them pieces of music that they can perform on. And if they can't perform the music, you either get somebody else or you train them to be able to do it. And to me, it gave me the whole philosophy of how I managed people throughout my career, including the whole gamut of it, of all of the scientists and engineers, and, and whether it was in the military or the civilian world, it didn't matter. It went back to me getting a piece of music from my music teacher in ninth grade. That, to me, groomed me to be an effective manager. That prepared me to be an effective manager. It gave me a life lesson to be an effective manager. To me, I love the word grooming. I understand his comment. I don't know how to answer you. How, 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 how else can you prepare somebody? I mean, you all are being prepared for something bigger than what you expect. Most of you guys and women are there to say, hey, I'm going to get this degree. I'm going to get this course. And then I'm going to become a therapist. Or I'm going to become a this. Or I'm going to become a that. And my answer is, I sure hope your life path supports it because you may be in for some prizes. <laughs> you're being prepared for things that you don't even know you're being prepared for. That, to me, is the way the universe works. If I look at my life, and I'm advancing in years, and I don't like to use the word growing old, because I don't want my mind to hear that I'm growing old. I'm advancing in years. I'm not going to buy into the paradigm that as you age, you become decrepit and you sit in a wheelchair in a nursing home trying to figure out what to do. My point is, when I look back at my life, I can could not have orchestrated it. I was guided. And I can give you all the way down to... I know sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, freshman year of college, senior year of college. I can show you where people stepped in and allowed certain things to happen. I couldn't orchestrate it. Now, was I gifted? My answer is 
Yeah, I was, because I was gifted to bring an understanding about the creative spirit into this world. I have no doubt about it, to try and bring people's attention that in their heart is this creative spirit. It's a creator. It wants to create. And that's what we're here for, to have these experiences. Now, that doesn't mean your life is any less blessed. They're all blessed. And the question is, how do we get in touch with that blessing? You know, how do we get in touch with the fact that within us is something so unique that's never been seen before, but it can't come out if we keep trying to do it the way it used to be done? You know, you know, the one thing, you know, I think of the ayahuasca experiences. Uh, Gabor Mate, I know, uh, talks about them and he takes people down to have them. I have a problem with them. No, I don't have a problem with taking ayahuasca. I got a problem with taking it within a tradition where you're being controlled by that tradition. But if you are to really have a relationship with ayahuasca, it has to be a personal relationship. How do you do that? How do you find the shaman who says, look, I got this big tradition of how to use all of this stuff, whether it's LSD, any hallucinogenics. And this is true for any spiritual practice or anything. I got all of this information about how I know how to do it. But I have to work with you to allow you to develop the relationship with the plant, with the tradition with the understanding for you to do what you have to do because you're unique. That's a hell of a challenge. And who takes the time to do that? Oh, uh, let's see. Your, your, your session is one hour. I'm sorry. We just ran out of time. We'll, we'll pick up next week. Even though we had a wonderful session. I'm sorry. We got to break it. I got another appointment at two o'clock. And you're my one o'clock, so I, I got to break it off. Whenever I met with somebody, they said, how long do you want to meet? I said, well, you know, one to two hours, maybe three. I don't know. Depends on what the energy asks for in that moment. It's a hard way to, to create a, oh, that's something else. People think, oh, my creativity is poetry. It's art. It's this. So therefore, my profession will be. I know of a situation where there's a gentleman who's a wonderful painter and he wants to paint and he has showings, but he's a carpenter. And he's annoyed because he's a carpenter and he can't make his living off the painting. And it's like, do you appreciate what you give people in the beauty of your carpentry? But that's not my calling. My calling is to be a painter. My answer is, hey, I don't think so. That might be part of your passion but you're being asked to be that carpenter. And if you're not meant to be that carpenter, you'll get to a point and say, I can't do carpentry anymore. I got to go find another profession. And I did it four or five times in my career. Why? Because the, that period ended and it's time to move on to something more broadening and developing that, that, you know, you can have 40 years of experience or you can have one year 40 times. You know, it's like, what do you want to do in life? I mean, if you do the same thing every day for 20, 30 years, did you really have 30 years experience or one year of experience 30 times? I'm a little radical. I, I don't fit into the normal way of. That's why I could never be called a therapist. A therapist wants to restore you to society. My answer is you may have a left handed path and your path is not that of society. So how can I support you to find your path? Yes. If you were um, going to lead a psychedelic retreat, how would you do it with your method? Um, or, or a ceremony or something like that? You know, I, I would have to spend some time pulling the string and saying, why do you want to do the psychedelic? Um, maybe we should take a walk in the mountain. Mm -hmm. Um are you doing the psychedelic because somebody says this is mind expanding or do you do it because I'm called for to experience this for, for some reason? I, I just feel it within my being that I have to do it. I mean, um, this is being recorded. So there's some things I would really not to like to uh, admit on recording. Um, 
It depends on. We can shut it off if you want. Huh? We can shut it off if you want. No, no, no. It's fine. It's. I, I knew. I, I knew I had to retire from the work I did in the Department of Energy because I knew my life would have to be an open book. I could not hide behind any. <laughs> Because, you know, in the oneness of creation, everything is known. To me, whether it's a, a, a hallucinogenic material, even if it's to sit down and, and to drink and have a, a, a glass of wine with your meal, a shot of whiskey, a beer, um, a puff of the uh, marijuana, the question is why? Well, it calms me down. Oh. And why do you need calm down? Why doesn't life itself calm you down? Why not your passion allows you to sit in the contentment of what's going on? So I don't think it's an easy answer. And if I did it, I would probably have to know each of the individuals, especially if I was leading it. You know, um, well, I guess you could take them to the amusement park and say, okay, let's have a ride and see if you like it. And that, that's valid. That's completely valid. And see what it does for you. And yeah, it, it's good. And okay, well, then the question, though, is why do you pursue it? Well, I love to ride roller coasters. So I'm going to get on a roller coaster every top opportunity I have. Well, that might be your passion. And to me, if it is your passion, it's going to lead to something else. It'll lead you talking to maybe a, a small child saying, you know, I had trouble struggling in school until I found out I really love roller coasters. So I became the owner of an amusement park so I could ride the roller coaster all the time. You know, I, 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 that's a good question. In honesty, I would say I would have to play the card as it dealt me. And it would depend on the people who are playing the game with me. In other words, if you were here and two or three other particular people, I'd play it differently than if they were you and me and, a different group of people. That's a really evasive answer, isn't it? I, like uh, I got to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> we got it recorded. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I can keep that for posterity. Uh, <laughs> what else, guys? Quarter uh, ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for this? Amazing? Oh, I, I want to talk about one issue. You're all young. You're probably all have heard of something called sex. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, what is that? Okay, listen, I may be wrong, but from my understanding, the purpose of sex was to mix the genes to ensure the survivability of the species. And based upon survivability of the species, the way you find the perfect match is to smell them. And I find this very intriguing because my first thought is we never smell anybody anymore. I mean, we all get showers. We use the deodorants and everything. I thought, well, the perfect experiment is to get about 20 people, get them all naked, let them sweat profusely, and then put blinders on and smell everybody. <laughs> that, that would give you the procreation match for what sex was, quote, made for. Now, we all know there's enjoyment with it, but if that's true, Everything else is programming of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. If that's true, everything, whatever you think, if you sit there and say, well, you know, I really like this guy because he's got black hair, or I like this blonde, or, oh, I love the blue eyes. My answer is somewhere it's programming. So when you look at somebody, and, you know, I, I tell you, one of the challenges I've had is when I look at somebody before me, sometimes I have to say, can I love this person? Can I love this person in whatever way is asked of me if that's necessarily for their unfoldment? And sometimes I'm quite surprised because there are people that I thought, both male, male and female, that, you know, I'm not really attracted to this person, even from the standpoint of having a relationship let alone engaging in something deeper. And when I get to know them and understand their story, they're beautiful people. They're all beautiful. It's just that we got so much packaging on, on our story that sometimes it's hard to accept each other for 
who we are. Like for me, I know anybody who has a beard is very intelligent, forceful, and knows what they're doing. Anybody who's cleanly shaven just buys into the paradigm that I got to look nice. So I don't really believe that. But I always like to use it. <laughs> so if your partner smells really good, that's a great sign. <laughs> no, it probably means I got a good perfume and they sucked you in with their pheromones. <laughs> Come on, grow up. This is the modern world. We're smarter than that. I could be crude and say, do you ever pay attention to dogs? Yeah. Well, there's your answer. Uh, um, if you have a question, seriously, you can always email me. You can find me through any of the websites. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, because some of this stuff is, like I said, Pandora's box. When you really start to think of the implications, this oneness, we're all interconnected. Nobody's in front of you by chance. And the question is, is it really that phenomenal? And I, and I will say, the universe is so magical. If you really believe something, you'll probably have some experience of it in some way. The universe can mold itself individually and collectively. So... Also, you know, I'm going to throw something out to you. People talk about the collective unconscious and how humans are captured by the collective unconscious. And I say, you're absolutely right. But global warming. Are we heating up the globe because of our fossil fuels? Or are we heating up the globe because there's so much anger in the human psyche of not being allowed to free, live free and true to our heart that this anger is what's being reflected in the globe? And the earth plane, which means the answer to global warming may not be fossil fuels. It may be deal with your anger and why you're pissed off and why you're unhappy. Because in oneness, that gets transmitted. To me, that's a heavy burden. You mean we are going to go in and do all this kind of work inside? How do we do the work inside? I better find a guru or a teacher that shows me how to do it. Or you can ask your own intuition and say, what do I need to do to get rid of any anger that I feel and then trust your intuition will surface it. And then you find the person who can help you deal with what your intuition said. They say, Hey, go talk to her. She's a pretty smart dude. She'll tell you how to do it and give you very effective ways to do it. But if you go first before asking your intuition, maybe a red herring. Sorry. I needed a name. You have a marvelous intelligence inside of you and you're educated people. I mean, there are, you know, I, I'm, I, this, this is a personal feeling, autistic children. I think autistic children are here with autism because it's the only way they can have their experience without having to conform to society. So they're able to have their experience without the burden of having to fit in. Because as soon as you find out that you're functional and you can fit in, guess what? You got to live up to the expectations of everybody around you. So anyways. I don't know if any of this has been any help to you. According to my Take time. Take comfort. <laughs> huh? Take some comfort. It take has. some comfort. Yeah, take some comfort. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Ken. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited about that class. And I, I do believe we'll probably be picking you up on your offer to answer questions. Uh, I'll see what I can do to mitigate them and make them uh, kind of combined. Well, it, it doesn't matter. People can okay. send them individually. Um, if you didn't have the constraint at five o'clock, I'd say, hey, I'm happy to sit around and answer questions. But you guys got to go through your program and comply with the requirements and fit into that mold. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just can't resist me. No, seriously, um, I, I don't believe. We're all here by chance. Some of you will say, hey, nice stuff, but doesn't interest me. Other of you might say, you know what? I got to follow up on this or that. I understand that. And all I would say is, is you all have beautiful lives to unfold. And the pattern for it is in your own heart. In that feeling that makes you feel life is worth living. And that passion. And it looks different for all of us. Um, so with that, it's 6.57. Well, uh, we're going to, hopefully the one of our um, 
viewers is recording this for us because somehow I lost control of the recording, but uh, we'll send it to you. And uh, there are other students in other classes that are hopeful to see this recording as well. So uh, I, I do have one question. Uh, seriously consider how you would diagnose somebody if, in fact, what I said was true, that the medical professional said, this guy is something wrong with him. you got to see a therapist. I was told that, and I did see a therapist. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, call up. He told me to come here. And she said, what? And I told her the story, and she says, I, I don't think so. She's the one that encouraged me to write. And she says, you just see differently. You have a different perspective. Um, so the reason why I bring that up is you will have people who come in front of you who are in a crisis because they can't find their own heart. And all I would like to say is within each heart is a wisdom. And if you can get anybody in touch with their own wisdom, um, to me, it's a great gift. So I think you're talking to your people, Ken. A lot of uh, the people in, in these rooms are learning about diagnostic criteria, but we're not leading with that. We do have a world now where a lot of clients are self-diagnosing and they're coming in because they have bipolar and they need help. So they're, and so we're here to kind of offer that education. But in the transpersonal program, a lot of us are uh, kind of disconnected from leading with that diagnostic perspective, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, I'll, I'll speak on at least half of the students in that regard. Well, I, I come from an older paradigm. I'm Before the DS. <laughs> in the world I grew up in, it was like, well, you know, you never argued with the authorities. <laughs> That's the military. Well, right. I'll tell you what, it wasn't just the military, believe me. So, in any ways, if there's nothing else, I guess I would say goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Ken. Bye-bye.